Hello, welcome back to our lecture. So in this lecture, we will discuss the stability of feedback amplifier. So first, let's start with the basic uh, system diagram for the, um, the feedback amplifier. So in a normal feedback amplifier, remember you would have basically you probe the uh, a portion of your output signal that to provide the feedback signal. So this feedback signal is actually equal to beta s naught, right? So beta, if beta is less than one, and this is a small portion of the output um, that is going to be subtracted from the input to generate the arrows, then the amplifier will amplify this arrow to provide uh, your output signal. Okay, so the subtraction is the key to provide a negative feedback loop. So as you can see, a portion of the output signal subtracted from the input. Um, the, the mathematical calculation for that subtraction is you can quantify the amount of signal that got subtracted by beta beta a. Okay. And this value beta a is often called loop gain. Okay. In previous section, we, we skip over uh, loop gain. They actually analyze the frequency response of loop gain. But if you take a look into loop gain, basically uh, either beta or a can be dependent on frequency, right? And because it's a frequency depend dependent function, um, what happened is that at a high enough frequency. The, the phase of loop gain it can goes to negative 180 degree and this behavior make the system become a positive feedback so instead of subtracting the, the a portion of the output now every single loop you actually add you actually add a portion of the output signal so every time you go through the loop it just a portion add up and add more and amplify more and add more and amplify more now you see if you keep going this loop then you basically broke the stability of your system to put then now you have an unstable system so here is how we evaluate our stability problem so initially we can use the diagram that we solve a feedback when we input the source in uh, then the signal went through the feedback loop to generate an error signal uh, which will be amplified to provide our output so the closed loop gain frequency response can be shown as um, so af is the closed loop gain s is um, stand for J Omega and you know Omega is basically just a frequency component uh, you can replace Omega for F just like just by 2 the Omega equal to pi F but anyway I mean we have been done a lot of example and we know that uh, so the closed loop gain is basically open loop gain over 1 plus beta a and beta a is basically uh, a value called loop gain okay uh, so loop gain you can represent that as t and t equal to beta a okay uh, so if t is a function of frequency uh, because uh, a is also a function of a function of frequency so since if you write down this uh, this t in terms of uh, ts in terms of j omega, so you know it's basically a complex uh, transfer function. It will have a magnitude and a phase, right? So it's another way to write down your um, closed loop gain frequency response or the closed loop gain transfer function. Okay, so if you look at this transfer function here for the loop gain, so this loop gain actually 
influence the stability of the feedback circuit Y. So if I have the magnitude of the loop gain equal to 1, when the phase is uh, 120 degree, then when the phase if I when phase is a hundred when this phase is negative an A degree, uh, this magnitude of loop gain will be negative one, right? So therefore if the magnitude of loop gain is negative one, look at this equation here, it will effectively make this denominator go to zero. Therefore, when the phase of loop gain equal to when the phase of loop gain equal to uh, negative 180 degree, this total value will go to this total value will go to infinity. So when the phase of loop gain phi t is equal to uh, 180 degree, uh, the magnitude of loop gain will decide is stability. So if the magnitude of loop gain at this phase is less than one, is less than one, then it's stable. Okay. But however, if the magnitude of the magnitude of um, how can I say this? Okay, if the mag if the magnitude of loop gain at phi t equal 180 degree is larger or equal to one, then it's become unstable. So as you see this example in here. So uh, in other words, you have to be able to control the value of t, especially the magnitude of t at 180 degree. Uh, if you allow phi t to go too large then it can make your system unstable uh, however if you don't have any if your loop gain is mostly zero then you don't have any feedback so um, you have to find a balance and the balance is basically you have to make it less than one okay so in this lecture today we will go through three example uh, and we try to analyze the poly plot, then we understand the stability issues of each example. We will go through uh, a one pole amplifier example, a two pole amplifier example, and a three pole amplifier example. Okay, um, for the sake of simplicity, we will assume that all of these amplifiers are basically uh, PDI. All, everything is pretty ideal is basically a uh, low low pass amplifier so uh, the high frequency component just basically coming from the input capacitance and uh, the uh, the Mueller the Mueller effect from internally from the transistor okay so for example we have this uh, coupling input and coupling output to be to go to infinity, here to go to infinity. Okay, um, then we have a current source. We have a current output also. Okay, so what what is the configuration of this? Uh, basically, it's a single stage uh, common emitter amplifier. So common emitter is grounded here. When you Draw the high frequency small signal equivalent circuit. Uh, you can represent this um, the whole C pi C mu complex. Remember, usually you have a C pi here, then you have the C mu here, but you can also represent this whole complex with uh, a C1. It's called input capacitance of the transistor. If you are curious about how to do this, just go back to the Mueller effect lecture. Uh, it's included in there. So this, 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 this capacitor here, when the frequency is high, 
this capacitor got short circuit, right? So then if this capacitor got short circuit, you can see that V pi, V pi will go to zero because this one gets shorted. If V pi, if v pi goes to zero, then G and V pi, the current, also go to zero. So that is why we have a low pass filter in here. Let's start analyzing. So let's start with um, I. Okay. So the goal for me is I want to maybe derive an expression for. Um, I want to derive an expression for for the for the gain. Okay. So in order to do that, maybe I'll start with the output and I'll trace it back to the input. So if I start with the output, how can I express the output current? If I look in here, I can see that the output current is actually equal to GM. Oh, it's not equal to. Output current only goes through the load. So it's equal to GMV pi, this current. But it got slit between GMV pi will be slitted between RC and RL, right? Therefore, you can use the uh, current divider rule to calculate IO to be equal to GMV pi multiplied by RC divided by RC plus RL. Now let's see how can we like can we relate the input II. So the input II, um, we know that this voltage at this point here is V pi, right? So we can use Ohm, Ohm's law, V pi divided by the impedance, divided for the impedance uh, of this total three element here. The first element is Rb, which is the uh, thevenin equivalent of R1 and R2. They have to be parallel. The second element is small r pi, okay, it's parallel. And the third element is the impedance of C1. In impedance of C1 can be calculated as 1 over J omega C1 or 1 over SC1. Okay, since we have that, we can write uh, a more complex expression for II. Finally, we can simplify it as uh, by using uh, a common term called R pi, large R or capital R. This R pi is basically representing for Rb parallel with small R pi. So this two block here is R pi, large R pi. Okay, so now we have an expression for input related to V pi. We have an expression for output related to V pi. So effectively we can find a current gain, right? So we write down the equation after simplifying most of the things. We can see in here we have actually two main terms. We have this component is independent of frequency. So basically this is our mid-band gain or because this case is a low pass filter so it's our low frequency gain. This component will yield our pole or it will yield our corner frequency. So here I'm gonna call it AIO. So now if I substitute uh, S for J 2 pi F um, I can have this equation to be written at um, AIO, which is the low frequency gain, over 1 plus J F over F1. And F1 is our uh, pole or the corner frequency at 1 over 2 pi large R pi C1. Okay, so the current gain can be written as that, right? So you can also break it down into magnitude and phase. The magnitude will be AIO divided by square root of 1 plus F over F1 square. And the phase is negative 
are inverse tangent inverse tangent of f over a f1 so this is the magnitude and this is the phase so let's plot them out so in the case of simple only one pole you can see the magnitude plot is very simple right it go flat until it hit the um, our pole then it will decrease at the rate of 20 decibel per decade for the phase uh, you can see that it never get the phase of our uh, plot never get lower than 90 degree okay um, so remember in the beginning we actually we actually need to be careful when we see that phase got lower than negative 80 degree but this phase never get anywhere lower than 90 now I've been speaking of negative 180 therefore we know that this system is it's gonna be stable uh, okay so now for the two pole uh, for the two pole problem so okay I mess up some animation there but okay so let's assume now we have um, a two stage amplifier and we're gonna have a small equivalent circuit okay um, this two stage amplifier is basically the first example one pole amplifier uh, you basically just make it into two stage like connect connected them together what I want you to do, you can just to see in here is I also use C1 and C2 to represent for the input capacitance that include the effect of C pi and the Mueller capacitance C mu. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to find a expression for the gain, which I mess up the animation and I gave you all in here, but let's go through everything. So first, the output is quite simple. It's gonna be exactly gm2 v pi 2. Why you can calculate v pi 2 equal to, to can relate v pi 2 to v pi 1 uh, using this node. Okay. So the voltage at this node is v pi 2, and you can calculate using Ohm's law v equal ir the current going through this this uh, cluster of resistance a parallel resistance or impedance is negative gm v pi 1 so going in this direction left to right that cluster include r l1 parallel with r pi 2 and noticing that i'm using large r here and large r equal to rb parallel with small r pi okay so the second component is large r pi 2 then i'm gonna have the impedance of c2 that's how i get this equation here so i put the note here about large r so now i can after relating v pi 2 to v pi 1 now if I can relate V pi 1 to the input current, I'm basically done. I can find my uh, gain, I can compare the output current to the input current, correct? So I'm going to do it. I know I have this uh, current I1 going in this direction. I have this cluster of parallel impedance, so I can use Ohm's law to express V pi 1, which is ii multiplied by r pi 1 parallel with impedance of c1 so i can have my current gain down here and now you can go down into this section you can see that um, likewise we have this term here is independent of frequency and that's our midband gain or another word is our low frequency gain. 
this term and this term will yield two poles for us. Uh, the first pole is F1, which is equal to 2 pi large r pi 1 C1. I mean 1 over, I missed that. And the second pole is 1 over 2 pi r one parallel large r pi 2 and multiply for C2. So this one will this F1, the first pole, is the upper 3 dB frequency of the first stage, while the second pole is the upper 3 dB frequency of the second stage. Okay. So we know the current gain, right? We also know the magnitude and the phase. If we plot the body plot, okay, we will first hit, hit, we will first hit the first pole. We will first hit the first pole. Uh, before the first pole, the gain stay flat at AI naught. After the first pole, gain will decrease by the rate of negative 20 dP per decade. However, when you cross the second pole, it will decrease at a double, at a two, two time rate. So negative 40 dp per decade. Okay. Now, I want you to look at the face. What do you see here? So you see that, okay. After, so the, a good trick here is that at the pole, your face will equal to negative 45 degree okay so if I only have the first pole my face will go up to here flat out at negative uh, it will be equal to 45 degree negative 45 degree as the first pole then when it when it's at negative 90 degree uh, it will just become flat but now I have the second pole so another 45 degree go down to negative 180 degree okay so here is the tricky part so technically um, your face can get down to negative 80 degree but fortunately it never get lower than negative 80 degree so as long as you operate your sensor before this region is basically still stable however if you operate your sense your sense sorry your transistor your, your amplifier sorry if you operate your amplifier uh, in this higher frequency range it on the edge of become unstable how about if we have a third pole so if we have a three pole amplifier system so in here we have basically a uh, an example of an op m amplifier and an op m this op m is basically a three stage amplifier when you have the first stage you can implement a differential amplifier stage right the sec second stage is a gain stage then you can have an output stage so so if each state has an equivalent input resistance and capacitance, input capacitance, so this circuit can be uh, considered as a triple amplifier, and the overall gain can be expressed like this. See, I just basically add another term for the third pole. Uh, I missed the animation, but anyway. This AO is our low frequency gain factor. And if I assume uh, F1 is smaller than F2 and F2 is smaller than F3, I can draw this body plot, right? This is my magnitude plot and this is my phase plot. So, likewise, 
the gain stay flat until F1, then decrease at the rate of negative 20 dp per decade until F2, then decrease for negative 20 dp more, so it become negative 40, then up to F3, 20 more, negative 20 more, so it become negative 60 dp per decade. Uh, before I go, before I start, I want you to look at uh, the phase here. Now you actually see that this phase plot actually go lower than negative 180 degree, right? So at some point, this system can be unstable. So I can have the loop gain represented as this. This is my the equation for my loop gain. So you can see that the phase component of the loop gain, um, sorry, the mag, the the phase component of my uh, loop gain and my gain is basically identical. If you look in here, I shaded uh, a green area. And to show this is unstable and why is it unstable basically this is the frequency where um, phase becoming less than negative 80 degree so there will be one frequency at which gain become uh, start becoming less than negative 80 degree right I will call this frequency F. Um, so the phase component of the gain can be represented like this, correct? So I can basically try to find Fu that make the phase become negative 180 degree. So I skip the negative side, skip the negative side here. So if you have one of the value for F1, F2, F3, you can solve for Fu. So FU is the frequency at which your system starts becoming unstable. Um, I do recommend you to try to go through the example. Okay. Try to go through example 2.19 on page 442 on the textbook as a practice. So I think that's it for today. Um, the next lecture, I will cover Nyquist stability criterion. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.